So we have uh, Ilana for, uh, from Oxford Quantum Circuits. In, and we'd like to see if we can bring it on camera. That will be an experiment that will go <laughs> wrong, but let's try. And uh, because we talked about the commercialization of quantum technologies, there will be uh, something you know, to maybe get a bit deeper on, super important topic we uh, try to look at at Quantum London. But also if she has any comments on you know, the DNI aspect we touched on. And, uh, Ilana, I think you should have now a button where you can switch your camera on. Again, this is an experiment. Oh, wow, it worked. <laughs> I'm surprised. Hi, Lana. <laughs> hey, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly yes. fine, yeah. Hello, I'm not dressed for the occasion, apologies. <laughs> Again, this is impromptu, so <laughs> thank you very much for uh, trying it out with us. Yeah, no problem. Um, happy to contribute where I can. Yeah, I think um, there are a couple of topics maybe you can uh, help us go a bit deeper. First one is the commercialization of uh, quantum technologies. Uh, if you maybe give us some insight on that. And also uh, in terms of the, the DNI, how do you apply those uh, principles in your uh, current venture? Yeah, of course. Um, so first of all, in terms of commercialization, I mean, there's a huge amount that you could could say um, about that. Um, but to to kind of narrow it down, we're seeing um, pretty much every single market vertical now start to engage with with quantum, um, particularly um, finance, pharma, anything to do with quantum simulation. So simulation of molecules and atoms. All of these industries now are more and more engaging directly either with quantum software companies that can help identify the problems and help them get quantum ready in that way um, but also we're seeing them start to interact with the hardware itself um, it is going to be a hugely disruptive technology so these companies often want to get ahead so that they can start to get first mover advantage and be be ready um, be ready for that um, in terms of the talent that they require, you know, we're seeing companies now put together small R&D departments that are specifically focused um, on developing quantum algorithms um, internally. Um, it is at the point now where we're on the cusp of moving to where you can start to have commercial impact. So right now we're still working with computers that are simulatable um via supercomputers um, so they're not doing things which are completely revolutionary yet but as we move and create uh, systems that have higher numbers of qubits um higher quality of qubits and, and ultimately overall higher system um system power we are going to start to see within the next three to five years some of these early stage applications um, that's not a that the commercial market is not here today because we are you know, interacting directly with end users, with customers, um, and particularly over the last year, I'd say there's been a, a significant uptick in um, in engagement directly as as uh, as more and more people are, are becoming quantum ready. Um, Roop, do you want to add anything to that? We have to remember that quantum is global. Yes, and so. Uh, and so you'll see um, uh, in the media, especially, you know, references to uh, to 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 a global. Reach. So many countries have their own national programs. Um, the multinationals are operating in, uh, you know, across the globe. And uh, and one important point uh, uh, I want to stress is is that we're seeing a lot of uh, enthusiasm, especially from middle school, high school, and above interest in quantum. But what does that mean? I mean I'm, I'm sort, of, sort of a challenge back to, to Ilana is, what does that mean when she's hiring people? Yeah. You know, I can, because I always say I can program a quantum computer. It's true, I run the IBM Q quantum uh, hub at Oxford. Um, but Ilana wouldn't hire me as a quantum programmer, and quite right too. But I would hire you in other positions for sure, right? Because 
this leads then to the second point that was made earlier that I thought was um, super interesting, which is, you know, we are not going to be successful. We are not going to build a quantum ecosystem or even a successful company um, unless we build a, a diverse and inclusive workforce um, and also make sure that we're bringing in plenty of skills. So from from industry, um, from academia um, and combine them and upskill them together. Uh, there's a number of, of individuals within my, um, well, two within my executive team that before they came and worked for us, um, would never have known what a, a quantum computer was. One of them has a background, he's an incredibly successful entrepreneur in video gaming. Um, another one was a technical entrepreneur um, doing business development across, um, so it's a company called What Three Words that was was working on, on data and identifying kind of specific locations um, through three simple words. Um, uh, we've also got project managers that have come from um, the automotive industry. All of these people have been absolutely transformational for our business and also transformational for all of our quantum engineers that typically do have more academic backgrounds um, and helping upskill them um, and, and teach them and, and, and vice versa. Um, so it has to come, like success is only going to come from working together um, like that. In terms of diversity and inclusion, this is something that I am incredibly, um, incredibly passionate about. And we're really trying to um, lead by example and as best we can with this within OQC. So you mentioned some fantastic resources. Um, all of our CVs go through um go through that to make sure that they are feminine in terms of wording because we know that men will apply for um for, mm -hmm. for opportunities um that are languaged more female than um, it's called but but women won't apply for things that are languaged more more male um so no ninjas in our um in our in our um specifications um we anonymize all of our cvs when they come in um, we recognised early on that there was a lot of underlying bias, particularly coming from Oxford with red brick universities. And we wanted to make sure that we were really assessing talent and skills with, without, um, with eliminating as much as we could from, from that. We do have um, our team undertake um, many of the trainings, uh, but we're still nowhere near where I want us to be, right? And this is with me as a woman, recognising that I come from a very privileged background and that um you know i'm 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 white so i don't have a lot of the additional challenges it's still you know our team is still not where i want it to be and there's still so much more that we can do um and this is where we then need to be interacting and how do we pull that talent that's currently coming through from a levels from grassroots levels how can we pull that in and, and make sure that we inspire and, and are building a truly diverse workforce and building the future that we want to see because the talent that is building this technology today will build technology that represents them and we need that to be inclusive um, and, and global as we can.